So welcome to the Augur call for November 6th, 2019, <clears throat> 11-6-19. And Carter, you mentioned uh, some things, uh, agenda. agenda. So we've got some risk updates, worker updates, and symmetric alignments things to talk about. Um, Matt Snell, what was the question you were asking at the outset about the license coverage? Uh, I was just making sure it was showing up. It wasn't showing up for me on mobile. Yeah, I mean, mobile. We Not have a separate, supported. Yeah, we have a separate mobile site, but um, I'm not quite sure why it wouldn't be showing up on mobile. Oh, I was just loading it in desktop view, um, so I'm pretty sure it was just my phone. Yeah. I believe that. I believe that. So... If we look at the <clears throat> things that we have right now, we made some updates to risk to include OSI license coverage. Thank you, Matt Snell. This is an example. Matt, are there updates to the download JSON? Yeah, it follows the uh, SPDX format that um, Kate had specified for us, to, like recommended for us to use. Okay. Um, it, it's It's got all the, all the new format recognized there. I've downloaded it. Is mm. it all online? Uh, it looks like it's a really one. Yeah. The, um, Zephyr is a rather large download. Yeah, it seems to be coming as one long line by default with no carriage returns. If I can show you. Hmm. So I have word wrap on, but if I turn word wrap off, it's it's like I don't think there's character turns. No, oh, okay, I can fix that. That's just a beautifying issue. Yeah. Normally I open it in Firefox, which does it automatically, but I can fix that. Yeah. Oh. For download, it's typically good to leave out those uh, empty characters. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you have a script or a plugin that can beautify it for you, Sean? Yeah, I'm getting there. I've opened it in Firefox. All right, so in Firefox, it parses it nicely. Oh, yeah. So that's... I think a file, inf file information is pretty you have to give it, It's a big one, so you would have to give it a moment, yeah. So this would be for each file in the package? Yes. Wow. Oh, so, boy. Yeah, so there are 10,156 files in Zephyr. Uh, generally, there's as many relationships as there are files as well. Um, I, I was just um, kind of instructed to give the whole thing when I gave an SPDX yeah. download. Or a I mean, SPDX standard, download. Providing the whole thing is not an unreasonable step. I agree. I think over time there might be things you want to draw out of it in a separate download. But mm -hmm. provided like a full ROM mm -hmm. and a condensed or something. But yeah. Okay. Are there, let me stop a minute and ask if there are any questions that folks want us to address other than what we've outlined on the agenda. Not from me. Matt Snell, anything you want to chat about? Um, no, I'm going to be working on getting the Zephyr instance updated, but I guess it's not relevant here. Okay, and we should get back together to finish the integration of uh, Augur, S Augur SPDX into Augur. Yes, I would like I to do like, that too. I feel like we're pretty close there. Yes. Um, so, worker updates. Gabe, do you yeah. wanna, uh, should I bring up something? Or? Um, maybe the alias table in the database. And then just the auger config. 
because the alias table, I put it on there because I knew you guys were talking about it. I assumed it was still a work in progress, but uh, well, actually, the alias logic is fully fleshed out and working mm -hmm. properly. Uh, we had a little bit of miscommunication on inserting the contributors, but basically, the worker update we're talking about. Um, I'm going to do a share here. Is for our GitHub mm -hmm. worker for our contributor data model. And what it's doing is uh, reading all of Facade's commits um, and Facade inserts contributors that it finds uh, based on the canonical or the email it decides is canonical. And then so the GitHub worker is going through all these canonical users that Facade has entered and going back through the commits and looking at the raw emails and determining which canonical emails have an alias email but is the same person. Um, and so, so the case is in I commit, I probably have 11 or 12 different emails that I've committed to because sometimes I end up committing to an email that's local to a server that I never even use. Yeah. And <clears throat> so anytime that email can be identified as related to me, which we do in a fairly automated way using a series of APIs, um, we map an alias to it. And then when you see, as this alias database uh, develops, when you look at commits, uh, I think you're just sharing the. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, what is I sharing? Oh, it's okay. Good. Now we can. As I look, yeah, as I look at commits, I share a different screen. Here, if any of these, in some case, in op, it may not be the case in, um, in, in the top 10, but oftentimes I'll have multiple emails to which I've committed to a repository. So what we do then is, resolve all of the emails to a canonical email. So whatever that is for a person, which you can set or you can, or we can determine for you automatically, which just be basically first come is the canonical email. Uh, each per, so every, so instead of having 11 emails with some commits assigned to them in a repo, I would have one email that would have the commits assigned to it across all of those. Yeah, basically just trying to make these things more user centric rather than email centric and not showing bringing all their commits under one showing them as one user rather than their separate alias emails that they may have committed under at different times. Um, so we got that logic working, which is very exciting. Um, and we're currently in the process of moving Facade's insertion of contributors over to this worker as well, which will make our commit counting process a lot faster. Um, and that's pretty much all that's going on with the contributor model at this point. Um, okay. And and then the insight worker has some updates. Uh, I don't know if either of you saw the test group for the push notifications of the insights. Um, on Slack, probably, yeah. uh, probably not, they're probably not in that channel. Yeah, so, well, we're in the testing phase of our Slack bot that works as uh, a notifier. Um, and so our insight worker is continuously searching through our repos and certain endpoints for those repos and finding anomalies. And as the worker discovers an anomaly, we're sending it over to our Slack bot where it gets posted as a notification in a specific channel. So we've been testing that recently. Um, and what we found so far is that it's kind of sending way more notifications than are necessary or would be practical because the purpose of it is to point out something to maybe a community manager like, hey, this 
metric had, you know, a significant decrease and, you know, maybe urge them to go check it out um, and investigate further. Uh, so it's not supposed to be a like five insights every 10 minutes, you know, it's supposed to be just every once in a while. So, um, yeah, so the way I've been running it and testing is I'll leave the insight worker off while we're testing and then when I want to test the insight worker, I'll turn it on. Yeah. So it ends up identifying just a crap ton of insights all at once. Yeah. Uh, in, in a more typical practice, you would simply have it running and as an insight occurred, it was uh, an anomaly occurred. So you had a spike in commits or a drop in issues, a spike in issue comments, so anything that's outside of a a parameterizable norm period, which the default is a, a year, 365 days, uh, is going to show up as a Slack message. And these are very, um, these are the initial Slack messages. We're still refining them. They're not, I would characterize them as not the Slack messages that we're going to deliver. They're just, we're testing our functionality. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question. Yeah. Um, so is this going to develop some kind of mean over time then that it becomes more normalized on its own or are we going to have to build it a different way? The mean over time is constantly regenerated. So if, if it's a 365 day norm period where we're looking for standard deviations of a certain number, uh, then that's going to be recalculated basically every day. Mm -hmm. So the insights are going to you know, roll forward in terms of what the norming period is daily. And you can set the period that you want to focus messages on as well. Am I understanding the, the anomaly period, right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so basically to address, uh, some people may have different desires and what they want to consider a norm in building uh, the confidence interval from. So. Like Sean said, it defaults to 365 days. Um, but what we've done recently is make that configurable because people's desires may vary. Um, and then also there's a second time frame um, that's now configurable also. That's uh, more of a detection period. Um, I believe we call it anomaly. Anomaly window or anomaly. Period. I forget. Yeah, I think it's something like anomaly window. And basically what that parameter defines is, uh, so there may be strays outside of the confidence interval within the past 365 days. But if your detection window is only the past 90 days, then it will only be logging insights that occurred during the previous 90 days. So like you're seeing in the Slack bot, it's only sending messages for insights that occurred in the past 90 days because that's the parameter we have set for the worker that's currently discovering these insights. And then so that also works towards people's preferences and also aids us in testing these notifier bots um, and lets us, you know, quickly change those things on the spot and figure out a good balance for these parameters. I'm looking for an example um, where I had configured one of these. Uh, it's basically a block in our housekeeper, right, Dave? Uh, in the worker. Yeah, it's in the worker block. Huh. And that instance doesn't have it, I believe. Um, and then another parameter that we're, that addresses that same point is uh, the ability to define the uh, define the confidence interval percentage. Um, and I have that implemented on my local machine. Uh, I just have to do sanity checking before we can bring that to master. Um, so if you're familiar with, sorry, go ahead. Dean. That'll also just help control the frequency of these messages. 
we're just trying to find a good balance uh, for different use cases that we're trying to serve. So the configurableness is not really a good way to do this in Google. But essentially inside of the hmm. auger.config.json, this is the block. that we would use. And then these two parameters here are the ones that I'm trying to pick a color, like half a color, there we go. Mm -hmm. the, the training days and the anomaly days are the parameters that you would put, which, you know, the training days are, you know, what's the period that you're creating your norm off of? And then the anomaly days is how far back do you want to go in terms of getting notified about anomalies? Exactly. <clears throat> So you can make those the same, and then you would just get notified about every single anomaly mm -hmm. eventually. And then actually something I'm about to push, I think it can be included because it'll be a very soon um, is a confidence interval parameter where you can define it to be 95% or 99 seems to be more fitting based on our tests recently. Um, I think it's going to depend on the, the volume and characteristics of a particular repository. So yeah, I think a repository with fewer commits and, and less activity might have a, high, a lower confidence interval than one that's just active a lot. Yeah, definitely. And maybe older projects, uh, would need a lower confidence interval because their metrics will be more stable. But we just want those things easily adjustable for the user because there's a bunch of different use cases we want to appeal to. So this is the back end configuration for the Slack notifier that I, I showed you before. So the messages would come to the Slack notifier from the site worker. Yeah. Yep. Any questions, thoughts, ideas? feedback i just got a question about um is this also in documentation somewhere what these things what these parameters do at this point it will be these these are like new in the last week oh okay gotcha so, I, I didn't know if they'd been there for a little while oops um, uh, no the insight worker has been there for a little while but the parameters for okay. training days and anomaly days are like in the last week and a half two weeks and the confidence interval is in development and all this will be pushed to master here in the next five days, I would say. Yeah, if the And we talked about the alias table. Carter, do you want to chat about metrics alignment and kind of like that's a I think a challenge for both tool developers in the chaos space, just making sure that what we're doing is aligned with metrics because we each have a set of metrics that we've defined that are not yet chaos metrics and we also have metrics that are chaos metrics that are in our systems that might not have a link yet mm -hmm. to the actual chaos metric yeah um, and carter operates the or helps coordinate the evolution group in addition to being on auger so mm -hmm. kind of two hats here yeah so so basically the the goal is we or, you know we've done a bunch of re-architecting we have a bunch of new uh, really cool data, um, and we can provide a lot more of the metrics that exist in Chaos already. Um, but what we wanted to do before we started implementing new metrics is to make sure that we have, um, it says one one metric implementation. Um, by that, it just means like if it's um, defined in Chaos, and we can, uh, like, we right now we're pretty much focusing solely on evolution just because it's easy to bite up one chunk of that of all the chaos metrics and it's the one that pertains most to the data that we can mine. Um, so basically that just means if we can provide the data for it and it exists as a metric in chaos, then we've implemented it and um, defined it, at least how we implement it in our tool, so that it would have both a definition in chaos and then an implementation in Otter. Um, and so once we've done that, we'll have like a, we'll hopefully in the process of doing that, we'll, we'll work on defining a lot of the metrics that don't have like formal definitions yet. Um, and by formal, I mean like they have the whole template filled out. It's 
you know, they'll have more than just the one like simple question about whatever it is that it's measuring. Um, and so once we've done that, we'll have, we're hoping to have a lot more metrics that could be candidates for uh, release uh, for discussion with the evolution working group. And then we'll also have, um, we'll be able to provide the links to reference implementations of these metrics within all of the chaos definitions. And so once we've done that, um, we're then going to work on defining new metrics um, mm -hmm. that haven't been implemented in chaos based off the data that we can collect, um, or just things that we you know, as the, in the process of collecting data, even if we can't collect it, um, things that we think would be interesting metrics uh, or things that we hear people are wanting to measure. <coughs> and then we'll start making the transition from moving in sort of not really maintenance mode, um, more just kind of catching everything up and making it be in sync to a, to a more exploratory phase of like um, metrics we haven't thought of yet that our stakeholders want, but that we can collect that we think would be of interest to the larger chaos community. So um, we're still kind of in the working, the early working stages of this effort. Um, we just had our last meeting, uh, last our first meeting last week um, to kind of sit down and figure out how we're going to tackle the problem because we have a lot of metrics in Augur and there are a lot of metrics in Chaos. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of, it's going to be a bit of an effort. It's not going to be a, you know, we're not going to be done by next week, so to speak. Um, but we we've got a good direction on on where we're going. I think that, that about that about explains it if that makes sense. I yeah. think I covered everything I wanted to. Yeah. So expect to I see. I'm gonna comment on that. Okay. Um, I think. I mean, I, I know Matt's been pushing this, and I kind of think the same way. That when I think one to one, I think the first thought I had was to put it from Augur into Chaos as like a flesh chat metric. So if we've already got the data available. Uh, we may even already have an endpoint for it, but we don't have a metric for it in chaos. I think that's almost more important to um, get those put into the, especially for release that's coming up soon, to put those into a chaos metric if we've got the data in Augur already. I just think it's really important to have that um, have that as a metric <coughs> if we have that information already. And with the new template that we have for chaos, it should not be too much work to write two sentences about what the metric is, one sentence about why you would want to look at it, and then talk in three sentences about uh, filters or implementation details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I definitely think that's going to be one of the things that makes its effort a lot easier, um, having that simplified template that's more um, like tool agnostic. Um, it's more just about how do you think about the metric and then some ways that some tools think about the metric kind of almost in two separate ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's really going to, I think, speed up and, and make that transition that you were talking about, Matt, from Augur to Chaos a lot easier as opposed to having to sit down and formally define, like, here's how you would implement it in Git and GitHub and Garrett. Um, just like, how do you think about it generally? And then how do some tools think about it specifically? Um, yeah, I, I think it'll, I, I'm hoping it'll, it'll, uh, It'll be able to go pretty quick, and I, I think we've already got a good start. We identified what nine, I think nine metrics we're just going to start with, just mm -hmm. kind of proof of concepts, and kind of iterate on those, and, and and work on them, and kind of see what's working, what doesn't, how mm -hmm. we want to approach it, and then once we've got kind of a process down, we're just going to try to blow through as many of them as we can um, at a reasonable pace, of course. That sounds good. You guys want to talk about? Any any questions? I just keep asking that just because I don't want to just keep talking if there are questions or things people want to know more about. I just had the thought that um, if if the agenda is almost done, then we can also use the time to already start writing out some of those metric pages based on what Augur provides, and we can do that collaboratively. Yeah. Um, we might be down for that. Hey, sorry, this is um, Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Hi, Sean. Sorry, I didn't respond to your email earlier. This has been a psychotic week. Um, I understand. I just really quickly wanted to say, does anyone have any questions for me to answer your email um, from the census side? I think we're we're all good. Everything's great. I think the only thing we're waiting on, and I just hadn't seen yet, is if the um, date access change had been made. But that I think was the only question date for us. Date access. You mean the the window of uh, yeah. 
dates that we show instead of it just being 2014 forward? Um, the having the, the 10 years, but having it be the, the axis ending on whatever the compiled date is today's date. Yeah, I think we, I think we have that essentially. The only time that it would not be today's date is if I hadn't run the collector in a while, which. Um, I mean, that's, that's fine. Just close enough for. Yeah. Okay. I'll well, make sure that. that you're up to date for the next, for tomorrow. That will be perfect. And let me know if it doesn't look like what you want after you look at it tomorrow and then we'll make sure that it does. Okay, hmm. can do. But um, besides that, yeah, like I said, um, the it's been incredibly helpful. We've been putting together the preliminary report on some of the results. So uh, a lot of the census data is getting included, not census data, chaos data is getting included on that. So. Excellent. Awesome. There you go. Hear it. It's great to hear. What is the consensus? I'm not up to speed here. Um, there's a separate LF project going on, looking at uh, trying to identify what the world's most used open source software is based on um, software comp composition analysis data. And uh, we had a preliminary list that we got put together uh, a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago, whatever the hell it was. And um, then turned that list over to Sean and his team to help us get the chaos results on it. And so um, that is essentially what we were talking about. This is for the core infrastructure initiative, right? Yes. Okay, then I know what we're talking about now. All right. All right, yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, let me know if you need anything else, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be glad to help with the metrics definition, but I'm on mobile, so I don't know how much I can do with the yeah. typing. And I don't actually know if we're organized enough because I'm in the middle of writing those up. Yeah. Um, I think we might be ready for that next week. <laughs> I think we're still sorting our ducks right now. Yeah. So I think it's a good idea, though. Yeah. Especially I've, when we're out of time. Yeah. Or when we have more time than we have things to chat about or questions. Yeah. And you say I, you're writing them out right now. Um, I'm using, I'm not, so I'm using just straight up Markdown so that I can just issue a pull request. I'm not doing Google Docs for the ones that we're working on. So oh, be that's a, fine. There'll be a pull request um, tomorrow. Okay. So I'd say the evolution meeting would be a place to bring that topic up. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely talk about it tomorrow. Okay. Um, if we can also work collaboratively in Markdown. So if you yeah. have something that you're advancing, um, you I, don't I have to don't, do it all by yourself. Yeah, I don't yet. <laughs> so, um, but I think we will by next week. Mm -hmm. We have a, a meeting scheduled for later today, a couple of us to to work on that. Yeah. Um, I think when we get our own, we took, it took Saturday, it took a good part of the weekend day on Saturday to pull our heads together so that we have a common understanding of what we're doing. Yeah, we kind of just had to stare at that, that release spreadsheet for a while and go. Okay, release when, spreadsheet, and then we API agree. docs, development sites. Yeah. For the working groups. Yeah. Released metric sites. And I think, I think we got some good resolution for the documentation in the general call yesterday. Um, that I think I think we haven't discussed this yet, but in the general call yesterday, it was discussed that we should maybe just point to the released metrics because those URLs are going to be more stable yeah. than the ones in the working groups, which have proven to be rather right. volatile. Vol yeah. volatile. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Even though hopefully defining a, a common and consistent structure would help, I still feel much more consistent or much more confident in pointing to released metrics than, than uh, Raw markdown files mm -hmm. on GitHub. Okay, so I'm gonna make my proposal one last time. We can just choose a metric and start with a blank document and start defining it together, just to go through the motion and uh, figure out how to. Do you have a metric edit. that you want to do that with, Carter? Uh, if you give me like three minutes, I can maybe come up with one. Uh, where the hell is this question?
Carter is putting something together. Okay. So I just issued a pull request against Risk to get the uh, open source metric, the OSI approved licenses metric into the um, license coverage. I almost feel like I would um, I would have a different name for it, but I don't know how much that matters. Um, I think I would call it something like OSI approval rating or something like that. I, I don't know. It's hard to put a percentage like on it. Percentage, right? Isn't it? Yeah, it, it is generally a percentage, but it has some more metadata to go with it too, to kind of define it. Yeah, and we can talk about the naming. The reason it's called, or the reason I propose to call it the open source metric is because that is what the Patrick and Nick from the OSI were calling it when we came up with this idea. What they okay. call it again? The open source metric. So how much open source is in your code base? So actually taking head on this supposition that people are making that, that it is somehow open source if it's not open source. Right. Correct. It's only open source if it's licensed by an license approved by the open source initiative. That makes more sense to me, yeah. So yeah, from a chaos perspective, it means if we call it an open source metric that we take a stand on the debate to right. say that we support the industry collaboration effort, whatever that we have with the open source initiative as the arbiter for what is an open source license. Right. So Carter's, we're, <coughs> I think we're still getting organized, Georg. We like your idea very much, but we're still, uh, Carter is going in between organizing chaos, evolution, and auger. And uh, right now he's just, his head's exploding over here with, um, there's, which one we point to, because there's, So I'm going to say that we do this next time when we're more ready. Okay, sure. Yeah. I need also, Georg, I have a question for you unrelated to chaos when you're available. Uh, just okay. while you have a second. I'll stay um, on the call then. Okay. What do you think? Did this come from us? So I'll be done. Yeah, I think we're done. Okay. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very much. Chat with you later. Thank See you, you then. Bye. Bye.